Just over six months ago, I picked up this launch day iPhone 15 Pro Max. And a few weeks later, because that's just how I roll, I also bought a Pixel 8 Pro. For the past half year, I've used these two a lot. Most of the time, one or both of them have occupied my pockets. I've taken them to six countries, shot thousands of photos and videos, and used each of them alongside their respective ecosystem of accessories. These are two of the most consequential phones out there right now, the iPhone being the pinnacle of Apple's technical achievement, and the Pixel showing Google's vision of Android backed up by AI and a phenomenal camera system. So this one's going to be a really tough choice, but as always, we have to pick an overall winner. So let's get into it. I'm Alex Dobie, this is XDA, it's time for Pixel vs iPhone in 2024. So right off the bat, these are two truly iconic smartphone designs. The Pixel with that unmistakable camera bar that I've actually been seeing quite a bit more out in the wild as the Pixel's popularity has grown. And of course, the iPhone with its even geometric borders, wide corners and triangular camera cluster. The iPhone also gets a big external hardware upgrade this year with the move to a titanium enclosure versus the aluminium used by most phones and the much heavier stainless steel of the previous generation. And it gives the iPhone an extremely clean and deliberate looking appearance that's arguably also a little bit dull in the current loadout of colors. The Pixel is definitely the more colorful of the two as well as being lighter and easier to use one-handed on account of its smaller proportions, 6.7 versus 6.8 inches on the diagonal and the aluminium frame. I don't mind big phones, I can even manage Samsung's gargantuan S24 Ultra without too much discomfort, but that said, I definitely think the Pixel has an ergonomic advantage here, and I'm less concerned about fumbling it than I am the iPhone. And despite some softening of the harder edges of the 14 Pro, the 15 series is still fairly flat and angular on the sides by comparison. There are quite a few areas where these two, of course being modern flagships, really excel. Both displays are excellent, approaching overkill levels of screen brightness in their high brightness modes when used out in direct sunlight. I also appreciate the iPhone's rear-facing brightness sensor, which helps it adjust based on light coming from in front of you as well as just behind. I still haven't seen this feature on any Android phone. And the call quality is fantastic in both models, plus the inbuilt speakers are loud, clear and bassy enough for easy speakerphone use or easy irritation of other passengers out on public transport. But on the other hand, I have to admit it's just not a fair contest when it comes to raw CPU and GPU performance. Google's Tensor chips have rarely performed at the tip-top level of their peer group, and that's fine, they're not necessarily designed to compete in that way. But still, it's a very one-sided contest when you look at benchmarking performance, especially graphically intensive tests between these two. Previous Tensor chips have a reputation for running hot, as well as not being the highest performing SoCs overall. And while I definitely agree with that statement if you were talking about a Pixel 6 or 7, the 8 series has closed that gap substantially. Especially if you're looking at performance on 5G, both are perfectly capable handsets, and unless you're running around all day taking speed tests, you're not going to notice much difference. Though that said, I have been using the sub 6 GHz version of these phones for the rest of the world. If you're using the higher frequency millimeter wave versions in the US or elsewhere, your mileage may vary. And speaking of connectivity, if you're looking to use a local SIM while traveling, then outside the US, both offer single SIM plus eSIM. I've used dual SIM on both while traveling in the US and Asia with no issues whatsoever. If you pick up the US version of the iPhone though, you can still use two SIMs at once, but you're all in on eSIM, there's still no physical SIM slot. The Pixel lines also had a pretty rough reputation for battery life over the past two years, mainly once again due to those notoriously toasty Tensor SoCs. But I think Google's come a very long way towards addressing those concerns with the Pixel 8 Pro. Now this phone is still a tier below the very longest lasting flagships, but it's up to that full day's use kind of territory versus the previous generation where I definitely could run it down to the point of needing an afternoon refill. If the S24 Ultra and OnePlus 12 are an A tier in terms of battery life, the Pixel is a solid B. The iPhone, on the other hand, is a trooper. Even with a smaller cell, this is unquestionably an A tier phone when it comes to longevity. Even on heavier travel days with lots of photography, the iPhone simply sips power. And I can easily manage multiple days per charge or six to seven hours of active use over a much heavier single day. And although both now charge over USB-C, RIP Lightning, neither really impresses with the speed of that charging. You're looking around 25 watts over a wire for the iPhone or 30 watts for the Pixel, in addition to wireless charging in both. I haven't picked up any MagSafe accessories for the iPhone just yet, but hey, I guess I should acknowledge that exists and does offer a slightly more convenient way to charge. That also works great with the iOS 17 standby mode. 
So the comparison between software here really comes down to more of a question of ecosystem. Because by now we all know the major differences between Android and iOS, both are mature, stable, pretty good looking, and unless you really screw something up, fast and responsive. Moving from an older Pixel to a newer one like I did going from Pixel 7 Pro to 8 Pro remains one of the easiest transitions to make in the Android world, with an awful lot of stuff just being ported across by default. Some obvious exceptions there include financial apps, but the pain point of having to set up everything again from scratch has significantly been smoothed over with the latest Pixels. Apple is still the gold standard in that respect though, going from 14 Pro Max to 15 Pro Max, the vast majority of apps and all their data was ported across flawlessly and even Apple Pay cards and banking apps usually just required an extra step of authentication before being returned to the state they were in before, as opposed to needing to be completely set up from scratch. And I was also impressed by how seamlessly the Apple Watch could be ported from one phone to another. On the Android side, that experience with the Pixel Watch still requires a factory reset. When I'm using a Pixel, I appreciate how much extra control I have over how my phone works, whether it's basic things like the icon grid size in the launcher, all the way through to color schemes and custom dialer and messaging apps. At the same time, Google has adopted some of the more appealing features in recent iOS versions like the clock font customizations. And if the rumors are to be believed, then lock screen widgets may well be making their way back to the Pixel in Android 15. Another major tentpole of Android on a Pixel has to do with ambient computing and AI features. The At A Glance widget is a great example of this, flashing up flight details, appointments, and other relevant information. Same deal with Now Playing for automatically picking up details of music when you're out and about. And more recently, longer voice recordings can be summarized by AI in the Recorder app. Of course, on the Google Photos side, Magic Editor is a great addition to the old Magic Eraser, using the power of neural networks to move subjects around in your shots. But the Pixel ecosystem itself is also going from strength to strength. With the Pixel Watch 2, you can have your watch automatically unlock your phone when it's connected and on your wrist, just like the Apple Watch. If you're using it with the Pixel Buds, you'll also get Assistant built right in and value-added features like real-time translation support in conversation mode. The iPhone experience offers limited customization from within the fairly rigid walls of Apple's highly curated platform. At the time of talking, Google's tracker network still hasn't launched, and so Apple's Find My Network still does a better job of letting you know where important devices, things, and people are located in the wider world. AirDrop is another simple but fantastic convenience that I appreciate in the Apple world. Google has its nearby share that works fine on Windows and with other Android devices. And when sharing between macOS and Android, there are good open source alternatives like LocalSend, but even that requires both devices to share the same Wi-Fi network. The iPhone has the dynamic island, which takes up more display real estate than the Pixel's hole punch camera, but offers some really useful real-time updates like Uber arrival times, call duration, and timer details, and can even bubble off additional background activities when you're doing more than one thing at a time. In the Android world, this stuff typically just lives in the notification shade, but having this reserved area for important ongoing tasks I found is surprisingly useful on the iPhone. But what's more, I really appreciate the iPhone's selection of always-on widgets on the lock screen, which Samsung has already brought over to its latest phones, and like I said, I suspect will be coming to Pixels later this year. I still find the iPhone's notification area more noisy and awkward to manage than the equivalent on any Android phone, including the Pixel, but at least the larger display and notification stacking means you can get a quick overview of any recent alerts in a relatively short space of time. For some people, the iPhone is slowly opening up to more third-party apps, especially in Europe, thanks to recent developments around the Digital Markets Act. But even outside the EU, you can still use different default keyboards and browsers. However, these sometimes seem like they're second-class citizens alongside the baked-in Apple defaults. The button to launch WebView content in your browser, for example, is always Safari. And even with a third-party keyboard installed, you'll still switch back to Apple's keyboard in some instances. But that said, as someone who alternates between the Google and Apple ecosystems, I've appreciated having all my passwords ready and waiting thanks to the fact that Google Chrome can act as a password manager on iOS. The big missing piece of the puzzle on the iOS side is generative AI, and supposedly these features will start rolling out in the upcoming iOS 18, which is rumored to be the biggest software overhaul since the original iPhone. The whole AI topic is still rapidly developing though, and even the Pixel is in something of a transitional period right now with the new Gemini living alongside the standard Google Assistant. So I guess I'll check back in a few months and see how the latest AI developments have affected both platforms. Finally, there's the question of software support, where Apple has historically outperformed Google with five or more years of iOS updates for its phones. 
That changes this generation though with the Pixel 8's promise of seven years of Android updates, opening up the prospect of the Pixel 8 Pro perhaps having a longer useful lifespan than the latest iPhones. What I will say though is that Apple has a stronger track record still of keeping older iPhones in a useful state with those newer software updates. So again, we'll have to wait and see how things pan out here. One example of how Google can still trip itself up with updates emerged earlier this year, with a Google Play system update causing issues with some Pixel's ability to access the device's internal storage. The bug took way too long to fix, in some cases requiring command line jiggery pokery to remedy the situation. That's obviously something you probably never have to deal with in an iPhone. For me personally, the camera is one of my phone's most important features. And this generation of Apple and Google phones are more closely matched than ever across a wide range of categories. The Pixel 8 Pro offers some fairly small but notable hardware improvements over the previous generation. Meanwhile, the Pro Max keeps two out of its three cameras the same as last year, but makes the jump up to a five times Tetra Prism folded telephoto lens to enable its five times zoom. Like I said, I've used these cameras in half a dozen countries over the past six months, so I think I have a pretty good handle on their similarities and differences, and the key areas that make a real difference to the overall camera experience. No surprise when it comes to the two primary cameras on these two phones then, they're mostly a known quantity. And the main differences here I think come down to colors and dynamic range. The Pixel typically brings out warmer hues with a bit more saturation its default setting. And in shots with high contrast, the Pixel will more aggressively even out the shadows, brightening them a bit more, whereas on the iPhone they tend to come out a little darker. This is more a stylistic choice than anything though, and even with those somewhat darker shadows, the iPhone still does a great job at bringing out color in those darker areas. See the red leaves here. Although for me personally, I think I prefer the punchier, brighter look of the Pixel. You'll see some similar color differences in this shot of Osaka Castle, a warmer image from the Pixel with slightly brighter shadows to boot. Although both images are great, I'd once again side with the Pixel. And here's another shot that shows off the way the Pixel handles images with a lot of backlighting going on. The colors here I think are more true to life in the Pixel photo. Moving on to the ultra wide, the field of view here is about the same from both phones, but once again with slightly lighter shadows coming from shots on the Pixel. In daylight, both take decent looking photos, and I think you could argue for either model in general daylight photography using that ultra wide camera. There's a much greater difference in low light though. This shot of the castle moat brings out much more shadow detail in the Pixel side, though at the cost of a softer image on account of that little bit of motion blur. The iPhone shot is a bit darker, but with less blurring and more fine detail. With a steady hand though, the ceiling for image quality is definitely higher with the Pixel's ultra wide, as you can see here in this skyline view. There's less of a difference in quality in the same shot taken from the primary cameras though, and you'll see here both produce great looking low light pictures with that little bit of extra light and slight touch of warmness in the photo from the Pixel. This should come as no surprise if you've used any recent Pixel or iPhone, but yes, both phones excel in their portrait modes. Even in lower light, I was really impressed with the quality of portraits I was able to capture with both devices. Here from the Pixel, for example, we have a very unevenly lit scene at night, but the Pixel camera does a phenomenal job pulling out a great looking shot. And in this backlit shot from the iPhone, the results are similarly impressive, and even more so if you view back the original image on a compatible HDR display. When it comes to telephoto, the superior processing of the Pixel and its largest sensor size really lets it claim a significant win over the iPhone. Weirdly, as I've said in earlier comparisons involving the 15 Pro Max, this 5x Tetra Prism lens is actually more competitive in darker conditions than it is in daylight, presumably because that night mode lets it take more individual exposures. So as you'll see here in this shot overlooking Kyoto, although the iPhone image is a tiny bit grainier and lacking a little bit of color versus the Pixel, it's definitely very competitive with the Google phone. And that's pretty typical of side-by-side -side night shots using five times on both of these phones. In lighter conditions, the iPhone seems to take fewer exposures as part of its multi-frame shot, leading to a situation where it has less data to work with to eliminate noise versus Google. Now, I'll admit the Pixel shot in this street scene here is a touch softer than what you get from the iPhone, but there's noticeably less noise too, and more color detail is preserved in the shadows. There are some rare instances where the balance swings in the other direction though, like this sunset image where the iPhone's night mode lets it produce a more evenly exposed image. But I think that's just the exception that proves the rule. And that larger sensor of course helps the Pixel towards having more useful long range zooming capabilities. As you'll see here, even in daylight shots, once you zoom past 10 times, there's a lot of visible noise that gets introduced in the iPhone image. 
In video mode, these two are also fairly matched, especially in footage from the primary cameras. In decent lighting, there's really nothing in it, with each phone producing bright, punchy 10-bit footage that looks great on a compatible HDR display. In moving footage, especially from the ultra-wide, they're also quite closely matched, and in this footage shot shortly before sunset, there's definitely more noise than I'd like to see from either camera. But both also manage to avoid any unpleasant juddering, even in this moving ultra-wide video, so I guess there's that. Obviously, punching back to one times allows for much smoother, clearer clips. Meanwhile, at five times with video, it's also a fairly close contest. Plenty of fine detail here, a bit more noise in the image from the iPhone, and a slight misfocus here from the pixel under this bright daylight. And a familiar situation in five times in a pan of a scene with a lot of movement, quite a bit of detail getting scrubbed away from both cameras. Shooting video at night, both the Pixel and iPhone do a decent job in footage from both the ultra-wide and wide angle, with pans producing cleaner looking shots than video shot at a walking pace. But while walking, I also found the Pixel to be a little bit more prone to that jelly effect than the iPhone's primary camera, and surprisingly with a little bit more noise to boot. And finally, that 5x telephoto. On both phones in dark conditions, you're going to have a really tough time getting decent moving nighttime video out of either of these, with the Pixel producing the noisier shot, but with the iPhone having almost all its detail getting smudged away to nothing. It's traditionally been said that Google's Pixel phones produce the best stills, but the iPhone rules video. And that's certainly true to an extent. I definitely think the iPhone has a bit of an advantage in low light video, and it can also boast ProRes log support, which will be a great help to creators and other professionals using this phone to capture content. But on balance, I think overall, I tend to shoot more photos than I do video, and time and again, using these two side by side on trips, I was reaching for the Pixel much more than I was the iPhone to capture that crucial shot. And that's a big part of why, if you told me I have to use one of these two for the next couple of years, my overall choice would be the Pixel 8 Pro. Photography is a really important feature to me personally, and Google still dominates in this area while being really competitive with the iPhone in video as well, especially compared to earlier generations. If gaming was a more important factor for me, or I really needed that multi-day longevity that Apple's A17 Pro chip can offer, then maybe I'd be more swayed towards the iPhone, but honestly, the Pixel's camera is a bigger draw for me personally, and let's not forget Google's phone is a good few hundred bucks cheaper. Apple's ecosystem is a huge draw, and something I really appreciate when my main SIM is in an iPhone, whether it's AirDrop, continuity, or the excellent wearable experience that the Apple Watch offers, but Google's ecosystem is becoming more comprehensive all the time, and I found that using a Pixel 8 Pro alongside a Pixel Watch 2, there wasn't all that much that I missed about the Apple Watch. Besides which, what the Pixel and Android experience lacks in polish, it makes up for in customizability and unique AI-powered features that are expanding all the time through those regular feature drops. But that's just me. Hit the comments, let me know which you choose out of this pairing. Stick around and subscribe for my take on the S24 Ultra versus Pixel 8 Pro coming in the near future. That's another pretty interesting one that might surprise you. That's it for now. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.